Good morning, everybody. Uh, hey, it's great to be with you today. I don't know if you know about this moment in world history that takes place tomorrow. It's pretty significant. Uh, my wife and I got married 30 years ago tomorrow. <laughs> they, uh, so. <laughs> it's, it's probably not going to go down in any history books, but it's important to me. So uh, 30 years, I know 30, not 13, 30, 30 years uh, that we've been married. The, uh, I don't know how we got that old. The, uh, it's a, it is a long time. That's kind of the point. Kind of the point. It's going to be one of those days, I think. Okay. All right. Pray with us. Um, there's a building here on Monroe Street that we are uh, in negotiations uh, for purchasing as a church. We have come to an agreement on the price. We've come to an agreement on the details. And now there's just a few legal things. Once it's uh, locked in, we'll be able to talk more about it. But please continue to pray uh, about that situation. It's going to help us uh, with quite a few things moving forward. Over the past 22 years, the common theme of what takes place on Sundays at East Coast International Church is this, taking a look at what the Bible has to say. For 22 years, 52 Sundays a year, that's what we're looking at. What does the Bible have to say? The reason we do that is because the Bible is one of the main ways that God reveals his character. The Bible gives instructions for daily life. If you are confused about what to do, the Bible can help with that. The Bible reveals God's will. It reveals God's will, what we should be doing. God, the Bible reveals God's love as well. So when we gather together, we highlight the Bible so that we can experience God's love and character, discover God's will, find next steps for our life, and allow our minds to to be continually transformed by the renewing of our mind through God's Word. So these are not things that can only be done on Sunday. We can also do these during the week. You could, in private, as you engage with the Bible, or Bible study groups, or small groups that are studying the Bible. These are all ways that you can engage with the Bible and experience these things, plus many more. We are in a year of Bible engagement, and so each month we're giving you different uh, portions of the Bible to go ahead and engage with very closely. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those are the three books or three letters that we're encouraging you to read this month. Now listen, if I'm being really honest, if you wanted to speed read those, you could be done in a few minutes, all right? It's not that long. It's not that long. But I'm encouraging you to slow read. I want it to take you 30 days to get through them, all right? It's okay. Slow read it. Like we just put a passage of scripture up on the screen a minute ago. That was slow reading. Really slow. Now usually you don't have background music when you're reading like that, but, but just slow read it. It's fine. So today we're talking about Philippians. Philippians was a letter written to a group of Christians in Philippi. That's the name of the, the, the city. And Philippi would be located in modern day Greece today in case you're curious where it's at. Philippians has some of the best, uh, not best, but some of the most uh, popular uh, verses that people quote or just say a lot uh, in in the Christian world. Uh, Things like, I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That's an inspiring passage. It means God's not going to give up on you. You're kind of messed up, but God's going to work it out. (laughs) All right, that's a great verse. Uh, Or another one, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a good one. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. These are good stuff. All in Philippians, a little tiny letter. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If your mind gets out of control sometimes, go to Philippians 4.8, and those are the things you should be thinking about. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's a good one right there, right? It's not really talking about running a marathon, but it's all right. You can say it anyhow. Okay. It's like when everything's going bad, you can deal with it because Christ is there with you. There's some good stuff. Good stuff in Philippians. Little tiny letter. Lots of good, good things. A ton more. So Paul, who wrote this letter, he was an apostle or one of the early uh, church leaders and pastor to so many of these churches that he started. He was out all over the place, all over the world. And he writes this letter 
to this church in Philippi. It's actually possibly three different letters they just kind of squashed together. But he wrote this letter from a prison in Rome. Sounds familiar because it's the same prison he wrote to the church in Ephesus from, okay, the book of Ephesians. He wrote from Rome in about the year 61. We know from Acts chapter 16, another part of the Bible, that Paul had gone to the city of Philippi and had preached the good news of Jesus and had helped establish the church in the city of Philippi around 50 or 51. This is not last week. This is a couple thousand years ago. Okay, this is a long time ago. This specific church was unique amongst all the other churches that Paul had started. This church was unique because it had a strong missionary zeal. It was consistently supporting Paul, and Paul had a close friendship with this church. This is the same church where the wealthy merchant Lydia, somebody say Lydia. She's a very important uh, but understated figure in the Bible. But this merchant Lydia... She, began, she was a merchant and sold a cloth, and she began to follow Jesus. She was wealthy. And this is where Paul and Silas were also thrown into prison because they had cast a demon out of a woman and broke the income stream that she produced. She was producing an income stream from her demonic possession and was doing some witchcraft and fortune telling, which is all bad, by the way. Stay away. If that's been part of your life, you need to renounce it. Like a little free, that's free for you today. That's a little free. I just want to stay there, but I can't. Okay. And so they get thrown into prison because they mess up the, ec- the, the, the broken economic system of the city. You can mess with the city all day long until you mess with their economic system that's broken. If a whole bunch of Christians decided we're not content with the government selling drugs and government-sanctioned gambling all over our phones. Oh, it got quiet. What? I am going to stay here for a second. I'm going to stay right here. (laughs) Delete the gambling apps from your phone. (laughs) If you're working at a weed store, quit. All right? Stop selling drugs to people. This is all not helpful, okay? It's part of a broken economic system that we live in. If we pushed back on that, we're going to also get some pushback on that. <laughs> going to get a lot of pushback. Well, I might be in jail. That's how much pushback we would get on it. Okay, anyhow. This is the prison they get put to. Paul and Silas, they're planting this church. They, they get in trouble for casting this demon out, messing up the economic system. They get put in prison in Philippi. And they start singing. They're all beat up, bruised from from all the imprisonment. And they start singing, praising God. An earthquake comes and sets them all free. The chains literally fall off of their hands and and ankles. And the door pops open and they walk on out. This is a whole different kind of stuff going on right here. Philippi had a lot of crazy things going on. And it was one of the spots that Paul was really fond of. And although he was traveling the whole world... Star, or a lot of the world, starting uh, churches and preaching the good news. He was particularly fond of Philippi. So he wrote a letter to one of his favorite churches from prison. And this is the book of Philippians, or the, the letter of Philippians that we're reading. So that's, that's what you're reading. So towards the end of Philippians chapter 4, there's a, a lengthy passage where he's talking, and you can feel the intimacy of this letter. If you're, if you're paying close attention. In verse 10, it starts, How I praise the Lord that you are always concerned about me again. That you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation whether it is on a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. See, it wasn't about a marathon. It was about starving. All right? Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians 
were the only one who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At that moment, at the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Verse 19. And we're going to land on verse 19 this morning. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Woo! Same God supplying for Paul, supply for you. Okay, that's the idea. Today, we're just going to spend a little bit of time on this idea of something called supernatural provision. Somebody say, supernatural. Okay, it's not natural, it's supernatural, meaning it comes from God. Supernatural provision is the act of God fighting and being victorious on your behalf in different situations. So you're going to track with me throughout uh, the rest of this service, I hope, and, and try to make this your journey. This is something that you're going to do. This is something that you're going to implement in your own life. And so verse 19 again, and the same God who, will take, who takes care of me will. Somebody say will. Will. Yeah, will. Like, definite. Like, he's going to. He will supply all your needs. My God will supply all your needs. Now think about your needs. What are your needs? Harley Davidson <laughs> is not a need. You didn't let me finish. It's not a need. All right? It's not a need. I assure you it's not a need. All right? But we all have needs. We have physical needs. We have social needs. We have mental needs. We have financial needs. We have lots of needs. Some of them are not always needs or really wants, but then we identify the things that are actually needs. We all have needs. And here we see God wants to provide for all of your needs. God is our provider and will provide. That's what, that's what Paul said. He will. There's an assurance here that's really important to pay attention to, an assurance. If God is your shepherd and you are the sheep of his pasture, he promises to take care of us. He will not abandon you. He does not look at his flock right here at 61 Monroe Street and say, you guys got way too many issues. There are so many needs in this church, I just got to keep on moving by to keep my reputation. He sees the needs that we have in this church. He sees the needs that you have as an individual. And he sees it as an opportunity to show off. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, you become his sheep. You join his family. He is your shepherd. You are irrevocably now part of his family. So if you are struggling and walking around, wandering around with no faith or no sense that God is willing or able to provide, remember this. As the irrevocable child of God, there are certain things that you can expect from God. As the irrevocable child of God, you can expect it. Let me give you some things you can expect from God. You're going to love this. First thing you could absolutely, assuredly expect will happen is God will discipline you. Amen. Woo! No amens. <laughs> no, one amen. The, one hallelujah. The, uh... <laughs> All the discipline going to Julie today. The, uh, so. But listen. We really should be very pleased with the idea that God disciplines us because God's discipline is kind and merciful. Yes. That's how you know it's God. Another thing you can expect is to be loved by God. Hallelujah. Another thing you can expect as the irrevocable child of God is to be instructed by God. Yes. 
And as we just uh, read from Paul, uh, you can expect to experience provision in your obedience. The The provision of God. You can expect to experience supernatural provision. Now, if of those four things, the only thing you heard was supernatural provision, (laughs) rehearse all four, all right? Rehearse all four. If you live with an expectation of provision, the expectation helps you to find it when it arrives. Every once in a while, my parents will send me like a surprise package. I have, there's this great little candy store in my hometown of like negative six people where I live and lived growing up. And the, uh, there's a great little candy store. And every once in a while, they'll send a pound or when they're being ridiculous, like two pounds of candy. Two pounds of like homemade chocolate. With no, oh, it's amazing, okay? And they'll send it. But at my house, there are two porches, a front porch and a side porch. And sometimes my parents don't tell me the package is coming. And the UPS or the FedEx guy, sometimes he delivers the package at the front door, and sometimes he delivers it to the side door. But I only use the front door, so I don't see the packages when they're on the side door. Sometimes I'll stumble out to the side door and find a package of candy that's been there for two or three or four days. I was not expecting it, even though it was there for me, and so I didn't know it was there because I wasn't expecting it. But if I were expecting it, I would look for it. And I would know if that wasn't on the front porch, I better go get it before somebody takes it off the side porch. Okay? Because I expect it, I can find it. It's so much easier to find God's provision when you expect it to be there. So just think about that. In the book of Exodus, chapter 12, particularly, the Israelites were finally delivered out of, in, in Exodus, the They were delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. They had been slaves for several hundred years. They were enslaved, and now they're coming out of of this slavery. Now, a a few years ago, we took about, I don't know, three years to go through the book of Exodus. We we went through through it. And the reason is so I could do this one point in this sermon today. Okay? So here we go. They came to a sea that they could not cross or get around. They're on their way out. They've escaped slavery. But the enemy still wanted them back. The enemy was chasing them. The enemy was about to overtake them. And now they're just at the the sea's edge. They could see the dust of the army coming after them. They could feel the presence of the enemy coming. I can imagine that they could just feel the the horse beats. That kind of from the distance. There's a giant army coming. The enemy, you might say, was close enough that when the wind blew their direction, they could smell the stink of the enemy that was trying to pull them back into captivity. Things were looking rough. But God was making a new covenant with them. And here's what it was. If they would be his children, he would be their provider. He would be their provider, and God would make a way. Even when there doesn't seem like any way is possible, God would make the way. So, Here's the point. Start looking for the way that God makes so that you don't miss his provision for you. It's not going to be the way that you make. It's going to be the way that God makes. Just think about it for a minute. They're at the edge of the sea. They're in real trouble. They get a committee together real quick to decide what their options are and what their choices are. They're trying to figure out how to make their way. This is definitely happening. They go... They're like, okay, I, got, I can do this, I can do this, we can do this, we can, we can try to... And they're coming up with all the ideas that are so obviously flawed, they know there is no hope. But I can tell you what way wasn't in there. Part the sea and walk through it. That way wasn't in the conversation. Because that wasn't a possible way. That, because that, that, they, were trying, they were coming up with natural solutions. It took a supernatural provision, a supernatural solution to meet their need. Exodus 14, then Moses raises his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land, so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. It wasn't Moses that made the way. 
It wasn't a really advanced DPW crew that came and emptied the sea, all right? It was God that provided the way out. <clears throat> the people did not provide the way out. God provided the way out. And when you experience supernatural provision, it is God that makes the way. And we need to give God thanks for those moments and those seasons of supernatural provision. For some of you, it's a miracle. It's a miracle of God that you aren't just like the curse that was on your family of origin. For some of you, it is God that you didn't get gunned down and that you could even be living here today. For some of you, it is God that got you out of some of the things that you got yourself into. The seas blocked the Israelites, but God removed the sea. There might be some insurmountable things blocking you and some obstacles in your way that you can't do anything about. But when the Spirit of God is in your life, you need to start looking for the way that God makes so that you and I, so that we don't miss it. You, got, you just got to know. Moses holds the thing up. People start walking in. People experience freedom and victory. They're going through. You know. You know that there's a couple Karen standing on the shore. <laughs> I, I don't know about this. <laughs> you know there's a couple of people. <laughs> I know it's not in the text. I know it's not in there. But you know that somebody was just second guessing if this was really God. <laughs> Look for the way that God makes and take it. 1 Corinthians 10, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Somebody say show. show. He will show you a way out. Amen. It doesn't say he will make you take it. It says he will show you a way out. You, I don't even have to talk about somebody else. You all know that there are times when God has shown you a way out and you didn't take it. I've watched so many people miss their supernatural provision because they were too busy complaining and not busy enough looking. God's showing them and they're not taking it. Literally, the oceans of the sea is parted. Like, what's God going to do for me? Just take the path. Or they're looking for natural provision instead of supernatural provision. And that makes a lot of sense to me as a human because I'm familiar with natural things. Amen. And so natural things are, are, are most familiar. But supernatural provision seldom looks like natural provision. When, when people hear about supernatural provision, they get really excited. And they go, woohoo, this is very exciting. God's going to provide for me. A check is coming in the mail. Woo! You know, yeah, everybody's so excited. You know why? You know why people get excited about the check in the mail? Because it doesn't take any work. It's lazy provision. You ever seen God do stuff that makes us be lazy in the Bible? You got to reject the lazy provision. Supernatural provision is part of God's character and faith building process in our life. Supernatural provision is part God showing off and part us stepping out in faith and walking through the middle of the sea. Amen. You actually got to get up and walk. You got to stroll on through. Amen. I mean, you could take some Instagram pictures in there. It's fine. <laughs> but you still got to walk through. God gives the harvest but you got to go collect the corn. God's provision comes with a little bit of work. Sometimes it comes with a lot of work because he's got a lot of provision. 
We should look for the provision of God when we hear the plan of God and we obey the will of God. When you do that, you need to start looking. Start looking. Verse 19 said, And the same God who takes care of me will and supply. Somebody say supply. supply. Will supply all your needs from his rich, glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. When the Israelites were in the desert, God sent a ridiculous amount of quail, like flying chickens, right? So there's fly, you know, the, the quail so that the people could eat meat. You know, they were hungry. So he sent, he sent them some meat. And each day, God would provide for them through something called manna. This is like a bread from heaven. Yeah, we're going to get to taste that someday. Jesus, when he was praying, said, give us today the food we need. He's making a connection back to this time when God actually provided food daily, supernaturally. Because it's this, Jesus is clarifying that God chooses for his children to take upon himself the responsibility to make sure that we have our needs met. In Mark 6, Jesus does something else. He feeds at least 5,000 people. There's thousands of people on the side of a hill. 5,000 plus. They're hungry. They've been hanging out with Jesus for a long time. They didn't bring enough food. They're hungry now. Jesus is concerned for them. And so he says, hey, let's, he says to his guys, his fellows, his disciples, he says, hey, let's feed these people. What do we got? They got two fish and five loaves of bread. And you know what Jesus does with two loaves, I mean, two fish and five loaves of bread? He decides to show off a little bit. He supplies all their needs. This is one of the craziest miracles in the Bible to me. Like, for real. How do you take, I can't get my head around it. Two fish, five loaves, feed thousands of people. You know, people try to explain this all the time. And, and, and they try to explain it in ways that, that sound so righteous. Like this one. You know, what really happened was that the words of Jesus spoke to the hearts of the men and women and they were generous with the remainder of the food that they had, and they shared it with everybody around them. Well, that sounds nice, right? But that's not what the text says. That's not what it says at all. It says that Jesus showed off. He took two fish, five loaves, multiplied it, and had enough for everybody with leftovers. What is he doing? He's setting the tone, just like God did in Exodus. He's setting the tone. My followers, who are my children... I will provide for your needs. I will supply your needs. The word supply seems simple to us, but the word here really means to cram. Like cramming a net full of fish, filling it all the way up. Or cramming something so full that it's pouring out over. When we are experiencing true supernatural provision, he will supply or cram full to overflowing all of your needs. Remember, it's not like God's like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to run out. I can only give you a little. Everything is his. Psalm 30 says this. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. <clears throat> the enemy of your soul and life wants you to go to sleep weeping and to keep you asleep. So that you won't get the miracle that God has for you. When God says, wake up, O oh sleeper, it's because he's got joy for you in the morning. Because joy comes in the morning to the child of God that walks in obedience. The Apostle Paul, Pastor Paul, tells us God will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Right. Now again, if somehow you have accidentally heard me say that this means you get three extra Harley Davidsons this year, you have misunderstood this sermon so far. Amen. Next one is align yourself. Align yourself. Line yourself up for supernatural provision. How do you do that? You join God's family. You obey God. We can mess up God's provision by being disobedient and stingy. You know, we can mess that whole thing up. 
to obey God and trust God. You can also mess up God's provision by taking it into your own hands. Like, we're all called to work, right? Like we, in February, we talked about financial ethics in the kingdom, and one of those core principles is work. Like, working and eating go together. Amen. One without the other is not supposed to happen. So we're called to work, but we're called to work at proper times and in proper ways. Amen. There's actually a time to proper, not work properly? Yeah, there is. There's a way to work in a way that's not ethical? Yes, there is. So don't sell your ethics and don't sell your soul. Think about it. How much value, how much is your soul worth? And if you want to know how much you value your soul, it's based on what you're willing to trade for your spiritual health. Now I know my spiritual health is worth this, but hey, I'm going to do this other thing instead. So $26 an hour is my spiritual health worth, or whatever it happens to be. How much value do you place on the call God has placed on your life? How much value do you place on it? Amen. See, God is responsible for the providing, for the provision. We're responsible to be obedient Amen. and to follow. So worship team comes back up. We're responsible to be good stewards of what it is that God gives us. If God gives you something, be a good steward with it. If God calls you to work and restore people in broken places, then you will never be content serving in any other context. And so you must recognize that God's provision will come in different ways than traditional. It will literally be supernatural provision. In other words, you must go so God can show. You go and God will show. Look for God's provision. Become a provider. You see, God's good stewards of what God does give you <clears throat> means this. It means <clears throat> that you don't hoard it. You don't hoard God's provision. You don't just build a bigger silo. You build a bigger opportunity to bless. A real practical example is Ever since our church started owning different properties, something near 20 different churches have shared our worship spaces. And in case you don't know that, we have lots of different churches that share our worship spaces. And in each case, we have saved those other churches tens of thousands of dollars a year. And we do that because God has provided for us so that we can help provide for them. And now, we don't just do that corporately. We should do that also individually. There's a maturity that occurs in your life when you begin walking with God. And you eventually begin to not just be the recipient of supernatural provision from God. You begin to become part of a miracle for other people. You get to be part of the miracle journey and the miracle story. When you read the stories of Jesus encountering broken people or people that are in desperate need and he goes and he rescues them. They're great stories and you can resonate with this idea that God has rescued me. Right? You, you can resonate with it. God has rescued me and I'm so grateful. But seldom do we put ourselves in the, the character of Jesus in the story. We don't like just move Jesus out, put ourselves in for the story. It, it seems complicated to do that. But then when you read in other parts of the Bible where Christians, early Christians, did the same stuff that Jesus did? Well, I got to tell you the truth. I put myself in that story. I put myself as, as the apostle. I put myself in as the Christian that's going around healing people and delivering people and setting people free. I'm like, woohoo, that's who I want to be. Right? <clears throat> when, whenever you watch those fun movies, those rescue movies, you know, the big ocean scene and there's boat's tipped over, somebody's holding on for dear life, and a, and a rescue helicopter comes in, and somebody you know, shimmies down the rope, pulls somebody out of the water, and saves their life. I get inspired watching those movies, but I don't ever walk away thinking, whew, I'm so inspired. I love being the victim. I think I want to be the guy that comes down and grabs somebody out of the water. 
right? It's because, it's because something within us recognizes that, that we're supposed to be partnering with God to bring provision and rescue to other people. In other words, that means I don't dread helping. I don't regret helping. I get excited that I get to be part of something awesome, that I get to, whatever it happens to mean, whether it's my time or my talents or my money, I get to be part of it. So here's some things for you as we close. Expect a miracle. Look for God's provision. Align yourself with God's purposes so that God can unleash supernatural provision on you and others around you. All right? Why don't we stand as we close today? Today, there are needs that are represented here. There are situations that you are encountering, that you are facing, and you may right now be able to identify that you are standing in front of a sea, and you cannot come up with a natural way around it. But you need God to step in. You need God to intervene. You need to recognize who you are in Christ. You are His irrevocable child. He is yours and you are his. And you can invite God into this moment. You can invite God into this moment. You can ask God to meet your needs. And today, as the worship team closes, I would encourage you, do exactly that today. Don't be afraid and do not be ashamed. Invite God to meet 